Hidden inside every animal on Earth is a remarkable story of survival. Tonight, an extraordinary event is about to take place. A team of leading experts are going to explore the inner workings of arguably one of the most iconic animals on Earth, the elephant. In this series, you'll see natural history as you've never seen it before, from the inside out. Just as you lift the bonnet of a car to find out how it works, we'll delve under the skin of these magnificent beasts to look at their unique anatomy and reveal the secrets of their evolutionary past. Richard Dawkins will show how anatomy provides proof of natural selection. Evolution produces almost perfect design, the illusion of design. It looks exactly as an engineer might have done it. Biologist Simon Watt will see how his own body matches up to the animal's adaptations. 42 seconds, pretty feeble even by human standards. And I'll be seeing these animals in action. When they're moving, it almost seems like they're running in slow motion. Join us as we go deep inside the elephant. Welcome to the Royal Veterinary College just outside London. Whenever a zoo animal dies, a post-mortem is carried out as a matter of course. After a very brave fight against a chronic debilitating illness, this elephant was euthanized because her keepers and vets felt that they were no longer able to protect her quality of life. Tonight, as well as trying to learn as much as possible from this elephant's tragic death, we also want to celebrate a life that's evolved over the last 55 million years. The closer one looks at an elephant, the stranger and more alien it can seem. Its legs are like tree trunks, supporting the heaviest animal that walks the earth. It can weigh as much as a truck. Its iconic flapping ears can grow to six feet. And its unique trunk is one of nature's masterpieces. But strangely, the key to understanding the elephant is hidden inside its body, its guts. And that's where our dissection begins. We fully appreciate that you may be a tad apprehensive about what we're gonna show you tonight, but as scientists, we are desperate to show you the kinds of things that you just don't normally see on traditional natural history programs. Before dissection can begin, we must release the gases that have built up inside. Yep. Elephant's guts produce 2,000 litres of methane a day. That's enough to fill a weather balloon. Our audience are veterinary students. They're behind glass not to protect them from the smell, but to prevent the spread of potentially dangerous pathogens. It's also why we're all wearing protective suits. Joy, from your point of view, obviously as a comparative anatomist, what's your main area of interest in, in the elephant? My main area is to see how they've adapted to their environment. I have to say it's hard to hear you at the moment on the basis of trying to, it just shows you though, how much gas builds up within 24 hours. This is an herbivore, and herbivores generate a lot of gas anyway because yeah. their gut is basically a big fermenting chamber. But now we have the additional gas of the postmortem decomposition. So that's added to the volume that you're seeing in front of us here. And on a comparative basis, I mean, obviously it is a mammal like us, but, but we're expecting to see some, some pretty extreme biological engineering in here. Absolutely. 22 years ago, I trained here as a vet. I was one of the students behind the glass just like them. But in my entire career working with animals, I've never witnessed anything quite like this. The sharpest knife at the college belongs to Richard Pryor. He works on most major dissections. To gain access to the elephant's guts, Richard must first remove its legs.
While he's doing that, let me tell you a little bit more about Joy Reidenberg. She loves gross anatomy and specializes in large animals. She's probably been inside more whales than anyone else on the planet. And what never ceases to enthrall her is comparing anatomy across the animal kingdom. What's happened now is they've lifted the hind leg off and they've also lifted the front leg off so that we can get access into the abdominal and the thoracic cavities in the animal. So this is the area where the shoulder blade was. And all of that's been pulled backwards, so now we have access to underneath here is where all the ribs are, and under here we should be able to see the heart and the lungs. On the other side, the hind leg has been lifted off, and so now what they're doing is taking the skin off so that we can have access to the abdominal area where the intestines are. I'm absolutely gobsmacked how heavy this skin is. It is amazing. It's amazing. In fact, it's like you can almost not hold on to it. I mean, it's difficult it is heavy. to carry it's very the weight. Heavy. I think most people see an elephant as a, such a large animal, they assume it's a fat animal, but it's really not a fat animal. And it looks fat because it's got a very big abdomen it's full very, of a fantastic... It's hysterical, but it's really it's, not. It's digestive system gives it that appearance, isn't it? Yeah. Which we're going to look at. Which is, the, which is next. the next part of the procedure. Richard, hold yours. OK, you can see the ribs nicely there, can't we? And you can begin to see now that the body wall is actually made up of a number of muscle layers and you can see three of them here three separate muscle layers the muscles running in different directions to give that extra support so the muscles won't tear in any one direction you've got that cross support ah here we are so you're now into peritoneum now yep You get an immediate sense now, having opened the abdominal wall, just how vast the digestive system is. Can you stand back, please? Look at it as it's coming out now. It's that, all of that, you need to That's be able huge. to fuel this That's massive really animal. Wow. That is colossal. That is incredibly big. That I don't is... think I expected it to be that big. I did diameter. not expect it to be that big. Again, you can see the, t the tension here with lots of gas being produced and some liquid content as well, so we just need to relieve all that pressure. Oof. Oof. <laughs> Sorry, <Mark. laughs> you did that deliberately. <coughs> so we're looking at here is the omentum, which is a, a fine tissue that holds all the blood vessels that are wrapping around the gut in this area. It has another function as well, which is if there's any damage to the wall of the intestine and there's a lesion or a hole penetrating through, this can clamp down over that hole and stop anything leaking out and spreading around the rest of the body cavity. Absolutely. It's, so, it's such a beautiful tissue. It's nature's Band-Aid. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. With the guts released, the team can now start untangling the intestines. Still warm. Let's take this one up this way. This one. It is important that we can try and separate this out so we can look at the different parts of this digestive system to see how the elephant manages from its plant food to get what it needs to be able to fuel this massive body. And isn't it incredible to be able to fit all this lot on the floor inside that body cavity? It is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Take your pick, Richard. But we've got to try and orientate now. Oh. This should be the, the rectum. Yeah, that's the, that's the rectum. That's the rectum. So. While the team gallantly try to sort out the orientation of the digestive system, let's take a look at this giant eating machine in action. Earlier this year, I went out to South Africa to find out what elephants eat that actually requires such massive guts. Park ranger Percy Ramagama has taken me as close to the elephants as is safely possible. Listen to that. That's a, hot, that's a whole bush gone over. It's amazing being this close. You can hear the start of digestion, the, the getting the food and ingesting it into the digestive system. And you can hear how destructive that is, the crashing and crunching of branches as they move through to take the food that they want. 
It turns out elephants will eat practically anything. No tree or bush is safe. Bark, wood, roots, even the soil they grow in, all are on the menu. But it's so poorly nutritious they need to eat a lot. In 20 days they'll eat their entire body weight in plants. Hence the need for big guts to process it all. Let's go back the, the wind is stable now. It's yeah. gonna just go to the wind. Okay. We need to move on because the wind's dropped and it's now going round in circles, so that puts us in a fairly vulnerable position. Finally, we've managed to get the digestive system laid out. So let me take you on a little journey that this elephant's food would go on when it's eating and when it was alive. Now, this elephant would have been fed a mixture of hay, but also things like fruits and so on. And obviously, that would go in this end and be macerated and chewed up by its incredible teeth, which we'll look at later. It would then end up in here, in a sac, which is the stomach, very similar to our stomach, that's connected directly to all this pipe work here that is the small intestine. This is where the kind of easy stuff to di digest is digested to get lots of energy out of its food that's quick and easy to harness. Then though, the small intestine goes round here, down this pipe here, and joins this massive bag here, which is called the cecum. We have a cecum, we have a little appendix next to it, which is relatively small because we don't digest this kind of food. But this is the really important part of the elephant's digestive system where fermentation goes on to extract goodness out of this incredibly rough plant material. That goes on in the cecum which is then connected to this massive piece of pipework which is the large intestine where some more fermentation goes on and the absorption of the goodness that the elephants manage to get out of here. And then finally when it gets down to the rectum out it produces a faecal pellet. Now look at this. They're not massively different in terms of you can tease this apart and it's very familiar as what started in the front end. It's not a brilliantly efficient digester but it stays alive and it's able to fuel this huge massive animal thanks to this part of its digestive system. Welcome back. We've been taking a close look at the elephant's amazing digestive system and we know it has to consume a huge amount of food to stay alive and fuel this big body. As we dissect this animal, we want to piece together its evolutionary history. How, for example, did the elephant's teeth adapt to cope with the coarse diet needed to fuel such a massive body? While Joy starts work on the jaw to find out, Biologist Simon Watts is going to look at the difficulties faced by the elephant's ancestors as their bodies grew in size. Just look at this skeleton, accounting for nearly 17% of the elephant's total body weight. It's the heaviest of any land animal. And it grew so big in order to house its massive guts. But that size produced a problem for evolution to overcome. How do you reach food on the ground? There were different solutions on neighbouring branches of the Tree of Life. 23 million years ago, Gomphotherium came up with one answer, increasing the length of its lower jaw to bring the mouth to the ground. And Ambulodon modified its lower jaw to dig with its shovel-shaped tusks. But this cumbersome lower jaw began to shrink on one branch of the Tree of Life, leaving behind a long nose to grub for food. The result was a group of animals we know today as elephants. To cope with so much rough fibrous food, the elephant's mouth evolved in an extraordinary way. Okay, what we're looking at right now is the lower jaw of the elephant. And right here is one of the really large muscles that helps to close the lower jaw. This muscle attaches at the corner and it pulls all the way up to this bony process right here. These are massive muscles and they generate a lot of heat because this animal is chewing all the time. If we move down into this area and we remove the cheek, we'll be able to see the teeth of this animal. So let's go down and cut that off. So here's the lower jaw. This is all bone. 
and now as we reveal this area, we can see the teeth. This is a lower tooth. Here's the second lower tooth. This is an upper tooth right here. And so these are grinding against each other. We can see much better if we look at it in a dry skull. And Gerald has a dried elephant skull over here that we can look at. Just explain first off, compared to us, and we have incisors, canines, premolars, molars, what is this the equivalent of? This is a typical molar type of tooth of an elephant. As you can see, this tooth is very long, much longer than it is the case in many other mammals. And you can see on the grinding surface here a lot of ridges, which are called lamellae. Uh, we have one lamella here, one of this section, and they were glued together with cement. Okay, so you couldn't store six of these teeth no. in your skull from when you're born. So you start off with a very small version of the tooth as a lamella. As that grows, it grows bigger, longer, and then glues them together in the jaw. It's like a, a conveyor belt. The elephant tooth conveyor belt starts at the back of the mouth where new sections of tooth, lamellae, are constantly growing and pushing forwards. As the front of the teeth wear out, the lamellae break off to be replaced by the ones behind them. In this way, the teeth are constantly renewed to keep the elephant munching away. Male elephants also have enormous canine teeth, their tusks. These are used for fighting, foraging and digging up roots. But where's the tusk in our female elephant? In a male, a tusk would actually emerge right over here. There's a flap right here, one on either side of the trunk, and you would see the big tooth, the big tusk sticking out here. But it's always been assumed that females don't have it, and we certainly don't see anything right here, so it looks like she has no tusk. But let's cut underneath and see whether or not she has no tusk. So as we cut through this skin and, and peel it back, what we see is there actually is a tooth buried in here. It's a very small tusk. And this very small tusk is maybe only about that big. It's projecting just a tiny little bit, not enough to come out of this pocket, but it's definitely here. The female tusk, or tush as it's known, serves no purpose to the elephant. But for males, it's a very different story. For them, size is absolutely everything. They've evolved such large tusks through sexual selection as a sign of the power and dominance of the bull. But more recently, new evolutionary pressures have come to bear. As Richard Dawkins explains. During the time when humans have been hunting elephants for ivory, there's a significant trend to get smaller tusks. It looks as though what's happened is that poachers and legitimate hunters are all the time shooting the biggest tuskers in order to get the ivory, with the result that there was a massive selection pressure in favour of smaller tusks. And so the average tusk size in elephants has been going down and down and down. It's one of the spectacular examples of evolution happening before our very eyes within living memory. It can happen very, very fast. The thing that staggers me is if this is, if this is 10 kilograms and this is a small tusk, in an adult African male, you could have a tusk that's 100 kilos, 10 times the weight of that, sticking way out. Just the skull with no flesh on it at all could weigh one and a half tons but you need to have that strength in the skull to be able to support these massive tusks and house your huge, great grinding teeth. But if you had it on a long neck, you would never get your head off the ground. Yes, that's true. So instead, elephants support their massive head on a short neck. But that produces another problem to overcome, reaching food on the ground. As we've seen, evolution's solution is one of nature's great wonders, the only limb of its kind, the trunk. The trunk is an astonishingly versatile organ. It is used for social purposes, for caresses, for greetings. It's used for drinking, it's used for, for feeding. 
you think about the problems of controlling the trunk, they're formidable. We control our arm, we've got bones with muscles on, and we can sort of see how when you pull on a bone, it, it, it'll move in, in predictable ways. The trunk doesn't have any bones, yet it manages to achieve the same kind of sensitivity of control. How it achieves that control is the next revelation from the dissection. What we've got here is the trunk of an Asian elephant. It has a little finger at the end. That's unique to the Asian elephant. If you look at an African elephant, it would actually have two dexterous fingers that could move in this area. But this finger can actually pick up very tiny objects, like a little peanut, and can move it around, bring it to its mouth. So what we're going to do now is look at these muscles and also at the nasal passageway. So Richard's got a cut right over here in one of the passages. This is the right nasal passage. And notice how deep down it is. There's quite a bit of muscle between the outside and where we're actually getting to the actual pipe, the actual breathing passageway or nostril. So what we're looking at now is the tip of the nostrils two nostrils at the end of the trunk. And if we open one nostril here, this, this is the right nostril that's been cut, we can see that passageway as it runs the entire length of the trunk all the way up to the skull, where it enters into the skull. So this is quite a lot of volume that this trunk is holding in here. And so what we're going to do is look at the muscles right now. So here are the muscles that are surrounding this trunk. We have some that are running longitudinally along the length of the trunk. And as they run along the lens of the trunk, those on top are the ones that are going to lift the trunk up. Those on the bottom, they're going to lift the trunk down. We have muscles on the side that can bring it to the right and to the left. And we also have muscles shown here in cross section that are actually running circumferentially around the perimeter of the trunk. And they can regulate the volume of that space by contracting it down. And some that are radial that can actually pull out and open up that space and make it much wider. So how did the elephant get its trunk? Rudyard Kipling's version of events in Just So Stories is still enjoyed today, even by evolutionary biologists. I love Kipling's Just So Stories, O Best Beloved, uh, but they are shockingly un-Darwinian. You know, the elephant got its trunk by being pulled by a crocodile. Of course, that isn't how it happened. Natural selection works in a totally different way. So it's nothing like being pulled or pushed from outside. As for what the actual selection pressure, what was the advantage of having a long trunk? Well, one possibility is it's something to do with drinking. There were other reasons why elephants became big and tall, reaching the tops of trees, for example, like giraffes. And like giraffes, that raises problems for drinking. In the case of the giraffe, the whole head has to go down. And that means the head has to be small. Elephants did it a different way. They keep the head large, which has some advantages, and they then have a long pipe leading out of the head, uh, which is the trunk. Even though we now understand how the trunk works, its fine-tuned dexterity never ceases to amaze. Elephants can throw darts. And even paint pictures. The trunk is a classic story of evolution in action, a perfect solution to the problems of growing so big. But as the elephant grew bigger, the demands on other parts of its body grew greater. It required a lot of oxygen to keep going, so the lungs became turbocharged to cope. To see how they work, the dissection team are removing the ribs. been a tough old job because the lungs themselves are actually stuck to the rib cage. And with John Cracknell, who's a really experienced elephant vet, John, if I saw that in a post-mortem of any other mammal, I would think I was looking at the cause of death. But this is normal for an elephant. 
You're correct there, Mark. This is completely normal. This is the lungs here. In most other mammal species, what you'd expect is there's a space between the ribs and the lung surface, and it's called the pleural space. In the elephant, that's completely different. You can see here how it's attached to the ribs by this fibrous tissue, which has been trimmed away elsewhere. And the actual fibrous tissue is here, and as I lift it up, you can see the lung tissue adhere to the underside of this, which would be attached to the rib, if you imagine that as my hand. Now, this occurs on the diaphragm, on the ribs on the other side as well, and this is a hugely important difference in elephants that you don't see in other animals at all. While the lungs of most animals float in a fluid-filled cavity just below the ribs, the elephant's lungs are physically glued to their ribs by a unique elastic connective tissue. This, in turn, is attached to muscles which, when flexed, inflate the lungs. No other mammal breathes like this, so it must have evolved for a reason. Why has the elephant ended up with this system? The honest answer, Mark, we don't know. But there's a lot of theories on that. One of the original ones in the sort of 70s was that it was an adaption um, for being able to suck water up into the trunk. Um, so the pressure is generated in that. If you try sticking two hoses up your own nose and sucking water up, it's very, very difficult. However, new current thinking, looking at evolution, it looks like the elephants adapted from marine mammals, and this is actually an adaptation to being able to swim and snorkel. If you imagine when you're snorkeling in the sea, you're kind of on the surface of the water and you've got the small tube about sort of say long, and there's a bit of resistance there. Imagine you're an elephant and you have a sort of two meter long trunk, and then you're submerged much further down with a lot of water pressing on you. You need a lot of force to be able to open that up, and I think this is what it's for. It's thought elephants may have evolved reinforced lungs to withstand the extra pressure of snorkeling so deeply underwater. In fact, we now believe that the elephants' ancestors relied on water to support their bodies. Even today, elephants are at home in the water, thanks to an evolutionary adaptation in their distant past. Our dissection team has been piecing together the inner workings of the biggest eating machine that walks the earth. So far we've seen how its trunk provides a constant stream of food, how its grinding teeth break it all down, and how its guts expanded to cope with this relentless diet. But being so big has its downsides. On the inside, the guts generate vast amounts of heat as the food ferments while on the outside the elephant's skin absorbs heat from the African sun. It's a wonder they don't suffer meltdown, especially as elephants are not able to sweat. Scientists in Africa are trying to work out what's going on. I was looking forward to meeting one brave researcher who's managed to persuade elephants to swallow thermometers to see how they get rid of that heat. It's a tiny little device that's called an eye button. So in here is the ability to actually, re there's a thermometer essentially, an electronic thermometer. Yes, there's a little thermistor that, that records the temperature. It's coated in wax and that's attached then to a 20 centimetre ribbon. It's so that we can find it easily in the, in the bolus, in the, in the dung. And that gets coated in a little bit of chocolate. So it's a little bit of a treat and they get a little chocolate truffle. You Top still haven't got it in the digestive system, though. Not yet, and that's no. the bit I'm <laughs> interested in. This is a really tricky technique to get this right because they have to use water to get the elephant to start swallowing before they lob it in so it gulps it down without actually realising it's there. Well, that's the theory, anyway. Are you ready? So, hopefully, now we'll just wait a couple of hours to a couple of days and uh, hopefully it will come out in the feces. Oh. Good boy. 
Over the next 24 hours, Nadine's equipment will work its way through the elephant's guts. It'll record the elephant's body temperature every five minutes, day and night. Then it's just a matter of recovering the equipment. But you need a nice, fresh, steaming pile, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Some here. There we go. Just uh, sort of move it around and mush it around. You, you're, and, uh, you're a tool using mammal, so you use it <laughs> very sensible. Yes. Oh, hang on. No, no, <laughs> yes, there, there, yes, there. yes. So, there we go. So, oh, do you know that is steaming? Yep. Oh, so that is still warm. The thermometer reveals that the temperature inside the elephant remains surprisingly constant at around 37 degrees, about the same as us. But the elephant's outside temperature is a different story. Using a thermal imaging camera, the scientists measure skin temperatures of over 55 degrees during the day. And their external temperature remains high during the cold nights to keep the elephant warm. But just before dawn, their skin temperature drops dramatically. Somehow, elephants are managing to dump their extra heat. We know they don't sweat, so how are they doing it? The answer lies in a surprising part of their anatomy, their ears. Joy's carrying out some very fine dissection work that'll explain why elephants need such big ears. If we look at the back of the ear and open it up, what we see are a whole bunch of blood vessels that are running here. So the elephant takes its hot blood, runs it into this ear where the vessels are close to the surface and then is able to radiate off that heat. They can actually throw all of their blood from their entire body through this radiator in only about 20 minutes. And if they actually flap the air back and forth and create an air current across it, that helps with the cooling. It's a remarkably simple system. Warm blood is pumped from the body into fine blood vessels near the surface of the skin of the ear. Here it's cooled down by the air before being pumped back into the body. And by flapping its ears, the elephant increases the airflow to cool its blood more quickly. Evolution has found an ingenious way of preventing this large animal from overheating. As they became bigger, every part of their body had to adapt. Their skeleton had to strengthen to cope with the extra weight. As they grew, the legs evolved to be stiff, rigid columns supporting the body and allowing cooling air to pass beneath the belly. The ribs and the chest became more barrel shaped to contain the mass of guts, while the backbone, the backbone grew to be quite robust, allowing you to hang the entire weight, the entire body from it as a sort of arch, a bit like a suspension bridge, while the neck became shorter and shorter, moving the head closer to the front limbs and better able to support it, while the head grew to be massive to deal with the volume of food that they were consuming. Elephants have enormous strength. You provoke them at your peril. If panicked, they can run you down. How they support and move their massive weight is the next part of the puzzle for the dissection team. Imagine how your legs and feet would feel if you were forced to stand up for the whole of your life. Well, that's exactly what elephants have to do. But here's something to reckon with. This elephant is 40 times my weight, yet it's standing on a surface area that actually is only a few times bigger than the sole of my feet. It's clear there's something very special about elephants' feet. 
John Hutchinson is an expert in animal locomotion here at the Royal Veterinary College with a particular interest in elephants. That's right. Yeah. How do these incredible animals manage to, to cope with the challenge of carrying around so much weight just on four legs? Real bone, including elephant bone, is made of two kinds of materials. It's a composite. And we can do an interesting preparation here where we soak a normal mammalian bone in acid and remove the mineral component from the bone. And that's what we've done. What you'll see if I apply just a little bit of load to this bone is that it's remarkably compliant. It's remarkably bendy. In contrast, this is the same bone from a similar species, and bake it. Uh, really high temperatures, and that will remove the organic material, so we're just left with the mineral component of bone. And that bone is, is really, really brittle. Uh, and you can see right here, I can break it right away. So an elephant, just like any other mammal or other vertebrate, has a skeleton made of both flexible and rigid mineral and organic materials. Okay, I understand that, but how are the bones actually arranged in the leg? Elephants support their weight by having large muscles, but also by having nice strong bones and by holding all that together in a pillar-like system. You can see here, for example, this is a cross section we've taken of our elephant tibia or shank bone. And you can see it's quite solid here. You can knock on it. There's, there's no marrow cavity in the middle. There's no empty space. And this is a very strong way of building a bone uh, for handling compression, lots of weight on the bone. Elephants can weigh up to 12 and a half tons and their legs have evolved to support that weight. They spend their entire lives on their feet. If they lie down, they can suffocate. Yet when they want to, elephants can move surprisingly fast, reaching speeds in excess of 20 miles an hour. This produces potentially bone-shattering forces. So how do they manage to run? We all know that when animals like horses want to move fast, they change gait. It's just like a gear change in a car. It's a matter of efficiency. Avignon here is going to demonstrate some of the different gaits. At the moment, she's walking. She's always got two or three of her feet on the ground at a time. As she moves faster, she starts to trot. Her legs are moving in diagonal pairs. She's airborne for a brief moment. If we speed up even more, we get to the canter. Her feet are off the ground for even longer. If she goes any faster, she'll eventually go to a gallop. The question is, when elephants run, how do they change their gait? When an elephant wants to go quickly, it'll switch to its running gait, which can go easily 10, 15 miles an hour, maybe faster. But John's sure that something else is going on. So, borrowing a technique from the motion picture industry, he films them with a high-speed camera. By feeding the images into a computer, he creates a virtual elephant. The results reveal that there is more to the elephant's foot than meets the eye. It's using the limbs like pogo sticks to compress and rebound with each step and vault the animal upwards. John, I'm really intrigued to find out a bit more about this pogo stick idea. And you've come up with a way of demonstrating it using a hydraulic press, yeah? Yep. It's just basically a car jack that we've co-opted for use in our experiments. So we'll be applying eventually quite a large load to this and it will show us how the elephant's foot responds to being loaded. Obviously when an elephant's standing you've got mm -hmm. three tons over four feet but actually if it was say running the forces on each foot as it lands is going to be considerably more than that. Sure, they can get up to one body weight on each foot at a time during... Okay, that's so that's three more. tons over just the surface yep. area here. But already it's beginning to compress a bit. That's pretty dramatic, isn't it, in the heel, how that's starting to swell out yep. sideways? Yeah, and so that seems like about the tension I'd expect in a standing elephant. Right, so yeah. you could have four times that force when they're running. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And then as it rolls over onto its toes, again, if you release the pressure, yep. I mean, it just feeds back in again and actually almost automatically lifts the whole limb. Yeah, yeah, there's some spring-like action to that, to helping to push it forward. I mean, the mechanics of this inside, from an anatomy point of view, are we able to have a look at that? Yes. What we uh, have done over here is 
taken a foot and run it through a bandsaw. Just take me through, this is the first time I've ever seen obviously inside a, an elephant's foot, so just take me through the, all the anatomy in here. Yeah, we've taken the cut right through the midline, so through the third toe, the middle toe of the foot. This is the very tip of the toe with a toenail just a centimeter, half an inch away from the bone. And then these are little toe bones coming up, so the elephant's standing up on its tiptoes. How many digits are they standing on? They're standing on five toes. So they yeah. are standing on five? Yes, okay. yep, exactly. Just like all mammals, elephants have five toes. In fact, the whole foot is remarkably similar to ours, right the way up to the ankle joint. But it's beneath that joint in the elephant's heel where the magic lies. What dominates the bottom of the foot is this massive structure, which we call the fat pad or the digital cushion. And that's just like your heel pad. If you touch your heel and push it, you'll, you'll feel that there's a squishy tissue in there, and that's what elephants have. It's just like kind of walking on high-heeled shoes, except those high-heeled shoes are made of fat. Okay, so when it's, so when it's walking then, it's coming, it lands yep. like that. It lands like that, well, about there. Yeah. Rolls over to a flat foot, and keeps rolling, pushes off with the tips of its toes, and the fat pad springs back. As the heel spreads out, it absorbs the weight of the elephant and is primed to coil back like a spring, propelling the elephant forwards again. It's a perfectly built shock absorber, trainers for elephants. Evolution has certainly granted the elephant everything it needs to support its massive body. But of course, even the best designs can fail. We know from this elephant's history that she was becoming increasingly lame. In the final part, the team will investigate why. The veterinary pathologists want to examine this elephant's joints to discover the cause of her discomfort. These are all the hamstring muscles that I'm cutting through right now. They suspect arthritis. Get ready, Mark. This might be rather interesting. Yeah. I can see something that looks suspicious. I want to be the best judge of it. Alan Williams is one of the Royal Veterinary College's top pathologists. His intuitive detective work helps him uncover mysterious illness and hidden trauma in animals from crocodiles to cats. What do you make of this? What do you think of that joint fluid before it disappears? Well, let's see how viscous it is. What I should do, if I'm, when I'm lifting the syringe, I should have little strands of gloopy material sticking to the syringe, and it's not quite... So it's a little bit more fluid. It's not as viscous as it should be. So part, part of the process of, of the degeneration and arthritis of the joint, you get more watery synovial fluid. Absolutely. The nature of the fluid changes. Just take us through, Alan, the bits that you're seeing here, because it is, it is dramatic. We've got a nice smooth cartilage covering over the surface of the bone. You can just see the edge of it along here. Now, cartilage uh, doesn't really have any pain fibres in it. So when the joint moves, it, it, you don't feel any discomfort. It's there acting as a cushion on the end of the bone. Now, in, in this elephant here, the cartilage has started to erode away quite dramatically. And when the cartilage wears away, the bone underneath has pain fibres in it. And so when the cartilage is lost, you're now rubbing bare bone onto another surface, and that hurts. So in terms of, of if you did the comparison with a human, if you had this kind of level of arthritis, it would be that painful, that debility. You'd be talking about an artificial knee replacement. When it gets as bad as this, because we have erosions on both sides, so the outside and the inside parts of your, your knee, top and bottom, this is really quite severe. And so this just, is just going to get worse and worse and worse. And we know this elephant has been in discomfort for a while. This kind of evidence absolutely vindicates the decision by the vets and keepers to, to euthanise oh, this poor uh, elephant, uh, uh, because no. quality of life with you, when you've got this degree yeah. of arthritis is, uh, uh, is unbearable uh, uh, to think about. I wouldn't like to think of the pain this elephant, or discomfort this yeah. elephant had every time it tried to put a lot of weight through this leg. And in fact, we believe that towards the end of her life, she was beginning to favour some of it putting a weight on other legs rather than this one. And at that point, the vets really, and the keepers really knew, you know, the, what, time what the, the time had come. The dissection has uncovered the pathology that led to this animal's death. 
but it's also helped us appreciate the evolutionary history of this giant. To get enough food, they need massive grinding teeth. And to process it, an enormous gut. A trunk to bring food to the mouth. And radiator ears to keep cool. And it's not just their anatomy that's been tuned by evolution. They've had to change the way they live too. To get enough food, elephants must roam vast distances. They must remember their route and stay in touch with other family members. To achieve this, they've developed brains larger than any other animal that walks the earth. Exactly what they're thinking remains a mystery, but their behavior suggests that they do have conscious thoughts which may explain that most poignant behavior when they find the remains of other elephants. They quietly caress the bones, sniffing them, turning them over as if trying to identify the dead. Besides us, they're the only animals known to ritualize death. Our post-mortem and dissection have confirmed beyond doubt that the very difficult decision that was taken to euthanize this elephant was absolutely the right call. But they've also made a significant contribution to our scientific understanding of how these mighty animals are built. There's no doubt that as the largest land animals on Earth, elephants push biological engineering to the absolute extreme. I really hope that what we've shown you in this programme helps you appreciate even more just how amazing elephants are. Next week we'll be battling against the elements a new life. as the team dissect a whale. This is an incredible hailstorm, it really hurts on your face. Joy will uncover its evolutionary past and we'll see why this animal's closest living relative is the hippo.